Okay, Ben, I think you are live and recording. So the floor is yours. I'm not hearing you at all, though. Okay, you should be good now. All right. Sorry about should that. I, should I proceed? It's all right. Okay. Yeah. Okay, we might be in business here. It's the reward that you guys get for coming in person. <laughs> That would be me. Um, I, oh, thank you. Yeah, if you follow us on social media and Facebook, we I do a uh, on this day in North Carolina maritime history, and um, I cover a lot of the shipwreck incidents and, and life saving service operations and Coast Guard operations. Um, I do it. I try to do at least three or four posts a week, and it, because our top or, or uh, you know, maritime history and environment is such a broad range there it's anything's kind of fair game but um 
yeah, I, re I really enjoy doing those. And I like to see when I get lots of thumbs ups and, and, and hearts and, you know, comments and interact with people. Um, you, you know, 30 years ago, this 20 some 30 years ago, that, that was not an option to interact with people over over the uh, internet like that, I guess, maybe it's 30 years, I don't know, <laughs> 35, who knows. But, but anyway, we can do this now. So um, it's a uh, it, I think it's a valuable way to stay in touch with people. And thank you for, for um, you know, the, the kind of the words. Um, so, and, and you may see some of the images that I put on those posts in today's presentation. So I, uh, what, what I'm kind of doing with this today is uh, talking about the life-saving stations that were in Carteret County only. I, I uh, have done presentations on life-saving service operations in North Carolina. In, in the past and have covered the whole coast of North Carolina and talked more about like what it was like for those men in the life-saving service, what their, their weekly routines and drills were like and some of the rescues that they performed, some of the gear they used. Um, but, but this talk, I'm gonna kind of just focus on where these stations were in Carteret County, what the surrounding area was like, um, you know, when the stations were built. And I, I highlight a couple of rescue incidents that, um, that are, are you know, kind of uh, a big big deal, I guess. Um, but there's so many rescues that that were were executed here in North Carolina that it's hard to you could easily do a a many page book about it. Um, and some people try. <laughs> uh, so let's go ahead and get started here. Uh, so here we have the North Carolina coast on a satellite image. Um, and the early years that the Life Saving Service was operating in the 1870s, a lot, a lot of our first stations here in North Carolina were along the Outer Banks. Um, so from here in Kurtzuck County down around Cape Hatteras and, and towards Ocracoke. Um, and, and that was mainly because that's where the weather was probably the worst and we were getting the most shipwreck activity, but it didn't mean that they didn't happen around Cape Lookout or Cape Fear, you know, shipwrecks happened there too. So as the service developed, and this was a, a federal operation, this was you know, funded by the federal government to, to uh, hire people, uh, crew members for each station, um, to provide the, the, to purchase the land, to build the station, to get them the supplies and materials they needed. Um, you know, it had to rely on Congress and the appropriation of money. Um, so today we're focusing on um, just the Carteret County area. I highlighted some of the places that we'll mention today. Um, so starting up here, you see Ocracook Inlet and we'll cover down to Cape Lookout and all the way over here to the uh, southwest towards uh, Bogue Inlet. So we're, this is the area that we're gonna cover here and some of these place names I have marked will come up again. Um, so U.S. Life Saving Stations in Carteret County. Uh, and I have the five of them listed right here. Now they came in at different times uh, during the services uh, existence. Um, so it would have been, they were built some between 1887 to 1905 and I highlighted their locations with a little uh, sunburst there so we had um, and the order on the right of this slide is the order that they came in that they were that they were built so we have Cape Lookout and then at the bottom um, I was talking to uh, you earlier about those those reports those annual reports that that are so valuable to people interested in this history. Um, this little segment on the bottom in the center there came from one of those annual reports from the Life Saving Service. And in the report, it listed all the stations in, in the country and their general location. So that's where I pulled that from on the bottom. And uh, we see Cape Lookout it says one and a half miles south of Cape Lookout Lighthouse. Uh, and then we move uh, up. The next one built was at Portsmouth. And that's up there by Ocracoke Inlet. Uh, and it gives the location northeast end of Portsmouth Island. Um, and then later we had one built about halfway in between. It was first called Core Bank. 
Station Core Bank, and that's because it is on the barrier islands known as Core Banks. Um, and it gave the lo location as opposite hunting quarters about halfway between Ocracoke Inlet and Cape Lookout. Now, hunting quarters is referring to a community that will later be known as Atlantic. Um, before it was called Atlantic, it was called hunting quarters. Uh, and then we had Fort Macon, which is the closest location here to where we are in Beaufort because Fort Macon was right there, um, Beaufort Inlet, and the station was named for the uh, brick uh, structure that's out there, the, the uh, defense, um, I think the third defense uh, Civil War era uh, fort that's out there. Um, and that says Beaufort entrance a quarter mile north of the fort. So it's actually listing the fort on there. And then lastly, Bogue Inlet Station uh, it says inner shore of Bogue Banks, a half a mile east of the inlet. And that's referring to Bogue Inlet. So those are the locations that we're gonna cover. Uh, here is a picture of the first station built at Cape Lookout, built in 1887. And I really like this picture because in the picture, so this is this uh, this structure is what the early life-saving stations looked like in the service. It was pretty modest building. It was pretty simple. It had somewhere to keep that surf boat that you see in the picture on the cart. And we've actually built replica surf boats right across the street in our watercraft center. And even uh, several, I think one of them at least, we even had a, uh, someone fabricate one of those carts for us. And one that we have is uh, on display uh, in, in Portsmouth. Um, and then to the left of that surf boat, now that's the boat that these guys, and the guys are in the picture too. Uh, it looks like they got tired of standing around for this uh, occasion. So they all sat down on the side there. Um, but this, they would have been posing. This was, they were posing for this photographer. Um, whoever that was at this time period. Um, but that cart to the left of the surf boat is what we call the apparatus cart. And that had some of the material that they used when responding to a shipwreck. So on that cart would have been the Lyle gun, which was the artillery to fire the line out to the ship. Um, that if it, at least if it was within 600 yards, anything any farther, and they had to take the surf boat out there. Uh, they didn't have a choice. Um, and it had the, the line there, it had, uh, um, the lead weights um, and everything they needed to set that up. Uh, and then the structure itself would have had the, the bunk quarter, the quarters for the crew, typically six crew members and, and the head keeper had his room. Uh, they had a kitchen area, they had storerooms, uh, somewhere to keep uh, supplies. And then, and then the nice tower at the top, that was the lookout tower. So they, they were looking out to the water for shipwrecks, uh, but they were also walking the beat every night and then during the day in, in bad visibility, they walked the beach looking for shipwrecks. Um, so if you notice in this picture as well, way in the background, you see the Cape Lookout Lighthouse. You can barely make it out there with the black and white diamond pattern. So this picture um, was taken sometime uh, after 1888. Um, I don't know the exact date on it, but so that was at at Cape Lookout. So here's the, the area. This is a chart from 1888. Um, and it shows Cape Lookout and why it was so important to have some lifesavers there because of the Cape Lookout shoals that you can see extending off of the point southward and, and southeastward. Um, those are very shallow areas of sandbars. And <clears throat> we're talking five, six feet of water. And if you have a large ship that's sailing past the coast, you better look out for those shoals because you're you're drawing uh, more water than that, and, and, and you hit those and you're aground, and then the waves can proceed to tear you apart. Um, so that is Cape Lookout there, and this would be Beaufort Inlet off to the west. So there would be Beaufort. Um, there's Moorhead City. Uh, this would be Fort Macon here and Bogue Banks. So just to kind of get our bearings for anyone that's not. Uh, familiar with the geography. So I zoom in uh, because on this chart, it shows you the new life-saving station that existed there in 1888. Um, and it's marked right here, it says life-saving station. And the little um, picture that they used to depict the location is actually a little surf boat with some oars coming off of it <laughs> to mark uh, on the map there. Um, and then you see up 
to the north and east is the uh, Cape Lookout Light. So that's the lighthouse that we saw in the picture. Um, and I've got a picture of that for you there. Uh, there's our lighthouse. This picture is from around 1899. The structure was built in 1859. So if you've been out there in the, in the more recent past, uh, the landscape looks a little bit different. Uh, at this time period, it's pretty desolate it's in, and sparsely vegetated, uh, really flat, just sand. Uh, now, nowadays, there's been some sand dunes that have uh, been formed by the wind and trees. Some trees were actually planted, uh, and then some trees have come up just naturally on their own. But it does not look like this. And this structure here off to, this, to the right-hand side does not exist anymore. Um, I think that would have been the original keeper's quarters to the 1812 lighthouse. So uh, now the Park Service is, is, a, is a great resource for me because they have things like this historic structure report where they uh, <coughs> published it and it had this, um, this, light, this plan of the site for the Cape Lookout Life Saving Station and that was in 1893. So now North is oriented to pointing towards the, uh, will be on the left side of this picture here, but uh, I like to, to point these out. So this is, this is a little, um, from, from what I understand, and I'm, I'm definitely no expert on this, but um, they, they had a few extra outbuildings at the, eventually at the Cape Lookout Station because the main building is Station A, uh, I mean A, that's the main station, but then you have, um, they have a kitchen that's built in 1892, separate, uh, to, to make their food. Uh, they had a storage house there, that's C. Um, they had stables for horses. That was not till 1892. Now they were never allowed to use the horses for the foot patrol. They had to walk it because they didn't want the, the surfmen to be going so fast and not paying attention to what was out on the water. So they, they could use the horses to once they found a shipwreck to ride real fast back to the station or use the horses to pull the surf boat out to the beach or the apparatus cart. Um, but they also had, they had a boat house back um, by the station too. Uh, so they initially they would keep, the boat was kept in the station and they probably had two, two boats there anyway. Um, so they decided to build a house for that to keep it protected from the weather. Uh, the wooden boats could, dry out and once you put them in the water then they'd leak um, so they didn't want it to dry out and become too brittle uh, and and one interest, interesting thing to me is g down here is it said keeper gaskell's private residence um, i was always under the impression that the head keeper stayed in the station with his crew but in this situation they said keep they have keeper gaskell's private residence but i don't know if he stayed there it could have been that just his family lived there so that's one thing about these, these early stations was that they were in pretty remote areas. Um, if you were in the service, that's where you were six days out of the week, you got one day off. And the one day off was usually spent traveling to go see wherever your family was because they didn't necessarily live right beside the station like Keeper Gaskell's family did. Um, so they might've been nearby in one of the neighboring communities. So you would get the day off the, the, the day before you had off you may leave at the end of the day and sail or row a boat, depending on where you were, uh, walk, ride a horse, I don't know, uh, and get to your family's house and spend the night and spend most of the next day with them. But then you had to get back that following evening because you were supposed to be on, on site again in the, in the net, that, that morning after your day off. Um, now, the Cape Lookout location got a new structure in 1917, and that's what's pictured here. Um, <clears throat> so it's a little more substantial of a uh, building. Now, I don't think they had the porch screened in. That probably came later. And the building on the left is, is the uh, new kitchen building for them. Um, I like this picture because it shows you to both stations, the 1887 station and the 1917 station, and then some of those outbuildings, storage, boat storage, and stuff that I was talking about. Um, and this is a National Park Service photo. And it, it looks like at some point they painted 
the original station white. If you remember from the earlier picture, it was not painted. And, and usually they weren't uh, painted. And this is uh, uh, the original station. In 1957, it was decommissioned. It was actually bought by a local person there in the area. And they moved it using a mule and a capstan. Uh, so they pulled it. I guess they set it on logs or something and, and uh, pulled it to this location. It took about a week to get it there. Um, but the property has since gone back to the National Park Service. The National Park Service is the one that operates Cape Lookout National Seashore, which is where all this is located. Um, so the, the structure is still there, but you'll notice some, some differences to it. There's no more observation tower. Um, I think they added uh, like this porch on it up here and these stairs. Um, and, and from what I understand, they have some money to repair and, re and fix up this building because it is a historic structure. It was built in 1887 um, and there's not too many of them left around. So the Park Service finally has been able to get some money to, to refurbish it and maybe they'll open it up. So if you visit Cape Lookout, you can walk through there and uh, see what the early um, station was like. So here's a um, more recent satellite image and it shows you where the original station would have been and where the 1917 structure still is. Um, and then it, this little circle here is where that first station is now located. So that's how far the mule uh, pulled that one and moved it out to there. Um, so we can see uh, the station would, the, the crew at this station would respond to wrecks either out in, on the east beach, what we call it, or over here uh, on the other side of the hook uh, on, on the southwest facing beach. And then the shoals would extend to the south end. So they did have, if you remember that historic report on the map, the drawing, they had a boathouse out here by the, this, uh, this water as well and had a, had a uh, way to launch a boat into the water there if they needed to go around um, the long way out to the ocean. Um, but this beach chain has changed over the years. It may have been closer to the lighthouse at one point and it may have accreted sand and moved eastward. Um, it could move back, you know, towards the station at some point and, and, and get closer, but that's the nature of a barrier island. They, are constantly shifting, it's just sand. So one uh, notable incident, one wreck that the crew of the Cape Lookout Station responded to was on March 18th in 1915. And it's notable because this would have been uh, shortly after the Coast Guard came to be. Um, at first it was the Revenue Cutter Service and those fellows were out at sea all the time on patrols um, and um, if, uh, early on dealing more with like, uh, hence the name revenue, dealing more with like um, tariffs and taxes and stuff on things coming in and out of port. But they eventually were responding to uh, distress, you know, ships in distress and saving people. Um, and then later we had the life-saving service. Well, in 1915 is when they actually merged and became the U.S. Coast Guard. So this was like the first rescue conducted by the U.S. Coast Guard. And it was right here at Cape Lookout. And what the clip that I have is from the annual report. So we have the date, March 17th, 1915, the name of the station nearby, Cape Lookout. Um, the vessel was a schooner, the Sylvia C. Hall. Uh, they were carrying lumber. Um, there were six people on board. That's the captain and crew. And the remarks were, the crew rescued from the stranded vessel in heavy seas. The picture is not of the Sylvia Sea Hall. It's just to, to paint the scene for you. Um, so the wreck happened on the shoals at Cape Lookout. It was a very strong southeast uh, gale. Um, here's our chart again of the, the vicinity. And I have the details here. I'm going to skim through them for you because this is being you can always go online on our website and um, go through this whole slideshow again. And you can even put it on mute so you don't have to hear me droning on and on. <laughs> um, so March 17, 18, 1915, this schooner was out of Connecticut 
under Captain Sprague and it had a load of Cypress lumber it was taken from Jacksonville, Florida to New York. They experienced a severe southeast gale, winds gusting over 40 knots. The, the captain and the crew tried to steer the vessel to the protected waters inside of the Cape Lookout Bight. So that would have been on the western side of Cape Lookout Point. And they ran into trouble and hit the shoals uh, about seven and a half miles uh, south of the Cape Lookout um, station there. Uh, the morning watch who was at the station reported to Keeper Gillikin that a ship was stranded on the shoals. The crew responded in the motor lifeboat. At this time period, they had uh, a rowing lifeboat or a pulling boat and they had a motor powered lifeboat. They responded in the motor lifeboat and approached the hull, um, but the, the, the seas were just uh, too dangerous. Um, two huge waves broke over their, the Coast Guardman's, uh, their boat. Uh, two of the, the crew on board were almost swept into the water. Another was badly injured and the engine was swamped by the waves and temporarily uh, conked out. So they, the, their attempt at rescuing the crew off the Sylvia Sea uh, Hall was temporarily thwarted. The captain said, let's pull back, uh, fix the engine, make sure this guy's all right, and we'll attempt again. So they're basically waiting out there near the shipwreck in these terrible conditions, uh, and the seas never subside that day. And for, this, uh, for the situation, the keeper decides, all right, we gotta, we're gonna come back tomorrow. Um, they're not, you know, they're, they're gonna save these fellas. And they head back to shore, but the next morning in the pre-dawn hours, they decide to tow the, row, the, the rowing surf boat behind the motor boat. So they get out there. Now they can launch uh, from the motor boat, they can, they can launch the pulling boat. And, and the reason being is that with those kinds of terrible seas and all kinds of debris floating around, you need to be very maneuverable. And the motor powered uh, surf boat was not very maneuverable. It's like trying to steer a big Cadillac or something, you know, it has, does not have power steering maybe. <laughs> um, and so they could use the pulling boat and could really turn on a dime, weave their way through debris from the ship, um, make their way over the waves. And then they were able to get in close to the schooner uh, the crew on the schooner secured a line to the jib boom, and one by one, they crawled down the line into the uh, safety of the surf boat. They take uh, three of the, the, or two of the crew members um, over to the motor, the motor lifeboat, which is sitting several hundred or so yards away. Then they go back and get the rest of them, do it again, and finally take them to the station where they're cared for. So that was the first rescue of the U.S. Coast Guard, uh, 1915. And we have a thank you letter from the uh, ship's captain. I wish to sincerely thank you and your sturdy crew for the valuable services which you rendered me and my crew of the schooner, uh, Sylvia C. Hall, which stranded on the shoals March 17th. Uh, also for the treatment shown me while at your station. Uh, you deserve great praise and I shall not fail to do my part in making it known. Yours is very truly uh, C.W. Sprague master. So um, the crew would have been taken uh, to the station, but not this station. And I put the wrong picture up because that wasn't built until 1917, remember? <laughs> um, but the crew was cared for at the station. So they not only rescued these people, they had to take them back and take care of them if they needed first aid, warm them up, give them something to eat, um, and house them until they could find passage to, to get to wherever they were going because the schooner was completely destroyed. They weren't getting back on that ship. <laughs> Um, and then there was a newspaper article uh, here that talked about um, they were finally safe at port. They were, they were taken from Cape Lookout after they were rescued uh, and put on uh, the uh, Coast Guard cutter, the Seminole, and arrived in, in a, I think it was either Charleston or, or Wilmington. And then they could make their way back to, to where they wanted to go. So uh, the next station I want to talk about a little bit here is the one at Portsmouth. It was built in 1894. They were fully manned in 1895. Here's another picture where they're posing for the camera and they're there on the porch of the station. You can see their, their uh, surf boat off on the right there. And then a little skiff here that they probably just used for getting around. Um, and the, 
location on the chart, which I'll zoom in here, but I wanted to show you the uh, Ocracoke Inlet. There's Ocracoke Island. So this is Pamlico Sound back here uh, in the Atlantic Ocean. And then we'll zoom in on, so you can see the little symbol there, uh, life-saving station. Uh, so here's Portsmouth right here. This is Portsmouth Village. And all those little black dots is a building or a structure, a house, could be the church, could be the general store. Um, Portsmouth was established in 1753. And by 1770, it was one of the largest uh, settlements, one of the largest communities on our coast. Uh, in, in this map from 1775, you see Ocracoke here, nothing on it. But then you see Portsmouth and you see the depiction of little buildings and such uh, on Portsmouth Island. Uh, this was a passageway into the sound where goods could be taken off of the large sailing vessels and sent up to New Bern or Edenton uh, in, in such places like that into Bath. Um, so it had long been a very important uh, seaport. Here's a aerial shot of the village. This is much later, obviously. Uh, there's the, a, a church, not the first church that existed, one of several, and some of the residences there. Um, I highly recommend going to visit Portsmouth Village if you have not. Uh, this is actually the best time of year because the mosquitoes and the biting flies will not be as bad and they will not drain you of your blood or carry you away. Um, here's the sh shot of the church there and one of the residences on the right, um, general store and post office and another house in the background. Uh, <clears throat> this was a 1950 photo. When I, when I went there, that building was painted white. Um, and another shot of this is good. So people were still living here at this time. Today, it's kind of considered a, a ghost village, but it's not a ghost village. It's just that uh, Ocracoke Inlet kind of shifted, the channel shifted and filled in on one side. So everybody moved over to Ocracoke <laughs> and it was easier to get a boat into Ocracoke as opposed to Portsmouth. Uh, and over time, everyone left Portsmouth, um, <clears throat> but they left all these buildings there. When it became a national park and seashore, then the park service has been in the process of maintaining these historic structures. But I love this photo because there's one of the residents there. If you can see her, she's hanging out with some laundry to dry. And that was in 1950. Um, and here's another aerial shot, but this one's good because I can show you the, the life-saving station and there it is. Um, and you can see some of the, the, the boats that they have there, the crew members. Um, there's the church, there's some of the other structures. So we're looking out, this is Pamlico Sound back here. Uh, but that's how they would have launched their boat, the lifesavers, to get out this way through here and out Ocracoke Inlet to the ocean. Um, and there they are in their pulling boat, uh, posing for another picture. This was around 1910. Uh, and here's a satellite image to give you a better uh, perspective. That's where the station was. There's the village. There's Ocracoke Inlet and the ocean out here. So they didn't necessarily have the luxury of being right up by the beach uh, or out here by the breakers where a shipwreck might happen. Um, but they still had to send someone out on patrol out on the beach and they still had someone in, in a lookout tower doing their best. Um, so they could send a boat to respond out this way or they could pull their equipment out here to the beach. Uh, they also, they did have a boathouse for, for a little while out on the beach. Um, and it was destroyed in, by a hurricane, but I think they probably rebuilt it and always kept one out there. Um, Cause it wasn't easy to, to haul that stuff that great distance. Um, so I wanted to highlight this one, this one incident here because this, from what I've read and understand, this is the largest uh, vessel, the largest single rescue of, of people off of a shipwreck. The most number of people pulled off of a shipwreck at uh, Ocracoke Inlet and the crew from Station Portsmouth were involved and this was 1903 so still known as the Life Saving Service and it was in May of 1903 that the Portuguese brig the Veracruz 2 which was sailing from Cape Verde Islands to Massachusetts with passengers but they also had some whale oil that ran aground at Ocracoke Inlet and it's not known if they were trying to come in to the inlet or not um, for some reason uh, the weather was not that bad but the next day, the weather starts to deteriorate. On the 8th, um, it wasn't that bad, but the, the 
crew members at Station Portsmouth, they saw the, sh the ship on ground and they went out and said, how's it going? You got everyone all right? And the captain was kind of like, oh, oh yeah, we're fine. Don't worry about us. Um, and they were like, oh, okay. So <laughs> they, they, the, on the ninth, the, the weather started to deteriorate and the, the folks in the, in the life saving service said, no, uh, we're, we're going to take the people off the ship for you because we don't want to lose any lives. That's our job is to protect people. <laughs> and so they uh, began the transfer um, they, they had taken some people off on the 8th, 36 people, but then they take the remaining 380 people. So this, there was a lot of people on this, on this sailing vessel. Um, and most of them were, were immigrants. Uh, and they take them off of the ship, but they're, they're kind of overwhelmed with the amount of people that they're trying to, to, to bring to safely to shore. And they actually call on volunteers from the, the village of Portsmouth and say, can you help us? We're going to get the bulk of these passengers off we're going to put them on this little island little sandbar probably and you guys take them from there to the village <laughs> because this is going to take quite a while to do this uh and all the meanwhile the captain's kind of like kind of shifty and kind of like oh, no we're fine no we're going to be all right um and, and the, the lifesavers aren't having any of it like no we need to get these people off because no one no one's going to move be moving this brig anytime soon the tide's never going to come in high enough to float it we're too stranded um this is just going to get worse uh and so all of these people almost 400 people are in the village of portsmouth and they, they probably tripled the population <laughs> of, the, of the village at the time and they're probably staying at wherever they can they probably had them in the church and as many as they could in the life-saving station they even put some of them up in the, in the uh, residences there uh, and and on the 11th, they get a um, the, the revenue steamer uh, to come out of New Bern and they take them all to New Bern. But supposedly the story is, is that um, the captain had taken all these passengers on board and said, I don't care if you have a passport or not, just pay me and I'll get you to America. And he supposedly, he makes his way to the mainland and does, has not paid the crew has taken all this money from the passengers that really don't have a passport or anything, and he leaves. Um, so there's kind of more to this story, but uh, I, I highlighted it because of the significance of the amount of people that the uh, lifesavers were, were uh, taking ashore. Um, so this station here was decommissioned in 1937, but it was utilized during World War II by, uh, as a um, mounted beach patrol could, the, the uh, Coast Guardsmen could head along the beach and, and what they were patrolling for was, yeah, shipwrecks, but they were actually keeping an eye out for German U-boats. Uh, we know that the Battle of the Atlantic that took place, U-boat activity was pretty heavy off of North Carolina um, and many attacks and many um, merchant sailors were uh, lost in those U-boat uh, uh, attacks. Um, so I, I like this picture be just because of the, the Coast Guardsmen there and, and all the horses that they have. Out at, out at Portsmouth. Uh, in 1946, the was, station was turned over for surplus and it was actually purchased and used as a hunting lodge. And that's when they put uh, screen, they screened in the porch. <laughs> uh, so they could do whatever they want to the building at that point. Um, and they screened it in for their comfort because of, like I mentioned, those mosquitoes and biting flies. Um, now it's included in the historic uh, Portsmouth village of, of Cape Lookout National Seashore. So if you make it there, you can visit and, and tour uh, building. Uh, now just down the beach was Station Core Banks built in 1896, similar type structure um, as the one at uh, Portsmouth. Um, a few differences to it. Here's the, the general location. So I mentioned this was across the sound, core sound from hunting quarters. That's known as Atlantic today um, on a pretty desolate stretch of beach, but the, at least they had the nearby community there of Atlantic. Here's a, a later uh, image of the station. This picture was taken after they had the tower rebuilt for some reason. I don't know if it was damaged in a storm or something. Uh, so they had a dock out here into the sound and then you can see the beach side um, where they could launch their surf boats into the ocean and respond to shipwrecks. Um, so 1940 is when Station Core Bank was renamed Atlantic after this fishing community. So this is a picture of Atlantic from 1950. You see the, the fishing boats there tied up. Um, and you look right here, you see this pretty cool looking 
old uh, car. Uh, and I don't know what was going on in the right foreground. It looks like a lot of debris, like maybe they had just cleaned up from a hurricane or something. But I don't think there was any big storms that year. Um, or it could have just been that that's what it looked like <laughs> at, down at the docks. Um, uh, the station was closed in 1965 and, and turned over to be ready to be surplused and, and auctioned. Uh, but um, un unfortunately, it burned in, in, in 1968. Um, if it would have been cool to still have it because it would be a historic structure. And this is a satellite image. As far as I know, it would have been in this general area, um, but nothing of much significance is left behind from Station Atlantic or Core Bank. Um, so mo moving along, we have uh, Fort Macon. This was the original station there, the original structure, 1904. And I think this was a postcard that they had made kind of um, depicting local attractions. Uh, you know, this area had, has, has been a pretty popular tourist and vacation area for, for many, many years. And attractions like this were, were kind of a, uh, you know, a big deal. Um, they might say, hey, we're, let's go down the beach and, and talk to the fellas in, in the life-saving service or eventually the Coast Guard. So they had all their flags out on display and, and they're actually on the, the crews on the porch. You can't hardly make them out, but they're up there posing for the picture because um, this was a, a, coat, a uh, postcard that was made. Um, now, in my other, my presentation where I focus on the activities and rescues and daily routine, I talk about how they practice the drill of firing the, the, uh, the Lyle gun and setting up the um, breeches buoy, which is like a, the modern, uh, the early version of a modern zip line where they bring people off a shipwreck. So they had to practice that out here at the station every week just so they could be proficient in it. And that would, if they were in a, a, an area where there's a community nearby or even people on vacation, and when they were practicing this drill, people would come and watch it. It was like a form of entertainment. Um, so they would come out to see these fellas and they might even see them uh, practicing with their surf boat because they would row out the surf boat and then ride waves back into the beach. There was a drill they had to perform where they had to flip the surf boat and then ride it back over. So that'd be pretty entertaining if you think about it. You know, this was back before people were watching stuff on TV and, you know, had Netflix and everything. Um, so here's the chart. I'm going to show you the location uh, of the station. Here's Beaufort Inlet, Shackleford Banks on the right. There's Beaufort and Bogue Banks, Moorhead City up there. And you can see Fort Macon LSS and a little depiction of the actual brick fort as well. I don't know if you can see it any better on this, but um, that's where the station was. Uh, now, Beaufort was established in 1713, but it proved to be a safe harbor along the coast. So for many years, uh, ships have been sailing in and out of Topsail Inlet which we call Beaufort Inlet nowadays. Um, so that would have been the, the location there. You wanna get out of a storm, you sail around Cape Lookout and you could come into what was a pretty natural deep inlet and channel, uh, pretty safe to, to sail into. Um, and I mentioned how people were coming to this area to, to vacation. Uh, I'm not sure on the date of this picture, but by the swimming suits that they're wearing, it's pretty old. Um, and I had an article from uh, out of a paper from Raleigh in 1884. It says, uh, across the sound, just a few hundred yards from the hotel is the beach, one of the finest in America. Here, a pavilion has been built 70 by 40 feet in which the visitors sit to watch the waves as they chase each other up the sanded slopes of the beach and break over the merry surf bathers. A row of dressing houses stretches along the shore for 200 yards, furnishing such accommodations for surf bathing as to make that one of the chief attractions. So, um, and that, that might have was either just a postcard or some picture or, or a picture that someone mailed to their friend and they had wrote a message up there about how they were having fun playing in the water and splashing around. Um, so the guys at Fort Macon Station, they weren't really out in the middle of nowhere. They were, this was all happening around them. Um, plenty to do and see and uh, they probably, these were probably guys that came from the, the nearby community that were, had families uh, right there in Beaufort. Uh, and here they are out practicing with the uh, surf boat. 
and they're probably in Vogue Sound is my guess, um, but that would be the head keeper standing up at the uh, steering oar there. And here's a 1935 picture of the Coast Guard station. They're now the Coast Guard. Um, and this picture is also, uh, this picture is from a hotel that opened in Atlantic Beach in 1935. There have been others prior, but I just wanted to show you, like, set the scene of what was going on in this area for those fellows that were stationed at Fort Macon. Um, now, in 1935, 39, they, they get a new building. And I think it was one of the only ones that really ended up being built here at that time period, um, like this, uh, architecturally speaking anyway. But this paper was, at th this the Beaufort News ran this article, the first of the new super stations. Uh, this is the first picture to be published of any new super Coast Guard station. Uh, which are being built along the North Carolina coast. It's located at Fort Macon on Beaufort Inlet and will be the first in a series of new station buildings to be completed in the Coast Guard expansion program. Uh, in the foreground, a member of the crew of Fort Macon is showing two summer visitors on the coast who are interested in this uh, particular um, building. And when you look at the picture, it's the Coast Guardman and on each side he has a woman in there bathing suits <laughs> and he's, I guess, trying to impress them maybe. Say, check out my new superstation, ladies. Um, I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, Are there any questions that go into the uh, Not, I don't think so. Not that I know of. Um, and I don't know what happened to them. Um, because the next station I'm going to talk about, I do know what, what happened to, to that one. Uh, but this one, I don't know. Here they are in this picture from 1950. There's the 1904 station. So I know at, at this time period, they were still there. Um, and there's the 1939 station. So I, I don't know. Um, I need to do further research on that and figure out um, exactly what happened to those. Uh, there's Fort Macon built in the 1830s. Uh, so this picture is not 1950, but um, you can see the parking lot that was built in for, for people to go check out the fort. Um, and some extensive uh, jetty system here to keep the beach from eroding. Uh, in, in 1924, the, the area all around there became a state park. So it became Fort Macon State Park. It was one of the, well, the it was these, the second state park. The first was Mount Mitchell, but nobody could get to Mount Mitchell at that time because there was no road or trails. But so they consider Fort Macon the first functioning state park where people could actually get to it. <laughs> Um, and this picture was from 1952. It shows you the, uh, this is where the current bathhouse is at Fort Macon, if you're familiar, but they had picnic tables and in the, in the changing rooms and bathhouse. Um, so a current satellite image to show you where the life-saving station would have been. And now it's, it is still a station, U.S. Coast Guard Station Fort Macon. It's still, still there. It wasn't like the others out at Cape Lookout that were surplus decommissioned. Um, discontinued. Uh, Fort Macon is still a station. And here's a more recent uh, aerial image. And this one's pretty cool because there's the Coast Guard Station. Uh, there's the Fort Macon State Park Visitor Center. There's the fort. Here's the Coast Guard Cutter Richard Snyder, built in 2018. Here's the Coast Guard uh, Vessel Smilax, built in 1944. And it's like they're all out there. I don't think they were posing for this picture, but um, might have been some occasion happening. Uh, so the last station I want to talk about, we'll wrap this up because you guys are probably getting, getting hungry. You want to go have some lunch. Um, this is Station Bogue Inlet. It was built in 1905. So it's very similar to that 1904 type structure at Fort Macon. Um, and again, another picture where the, the crew's out there on the porch. It looks like not all of them are out there. Maybe the others got tired of waiting around for the photographer, <laughs> went on to do something else. Um, here's the location of Bogue Inlet Station. This time on, on this 1917 chart, it's no longer marked as LSS. It's marked as CG for Coast Guard. There's Bogue Inlet, Bogue Banks. This would be Emerald Isle today. Uh, Swansboro's back here. And so that's the White Oak River. Um, Here's Bear Island. 
you're familiar with Hammock Beach State Park, that's where that is. Uh, and in 1941, they get a new station. So the Fort Macon got a new super station in 1939. Um, Bogue Inlet gets a new station in 1941, but I don't, it's, it does, it looks a little bit different than the, than the structure there at, that they had come in in 1939 at Fort Macon. Um, so what happened to the old station? Um, I don't know what happened to those ones at Fort Macon, uh, but I do know that the uh, original um, structure at, uh, I think I have that date wrong. That's supposed to be 1905. Um, the original structure at Bogue Inlet was decommissioned and sold. And in 1950, it was actually moved across uh, the sound over to Cedar Point. And here's a more recent Google Street image of that structure. Um, at first, it was used as a, a boarding house and I guess apartments almost, and then a private residence. I think they're kind of using it now as like a base of operations for a commercial fishing vessel that you can see out on the, this is the intercoastal waterway here. Um, so this picture, this is actually from Highway 24. And uh, kind of unfortunately, it looks like the building's fallen into disrepair. I think it, it's a historic building. It'd be pretty cool if it was refurbished and turned into some kind of, even if it was just a welcome center for the Crystal Coast or a uh, you know, museum highlighting you know, Coast Guard operations and the life-saving service and shipwrecks, I think that would be pretty cool. And it's right there on the water, uh, prime location, right on Highway 24. Uh, so this means that they moved it from here all the way to there on a barge. <laughs> um, and that was a pretty big structure to do that. I don't know if they took it apart in pieces and did it in pieces or what. Um, so this is a more current uh, satellite image um, of that. So uh, <clears throat> I want to kind of wrap up and end with this picture of the Cape Lookout station. There's the, the 1917 station. There's the, the earlier station there. Um, we had some radio towers. Uh, it was used as a signal location at, at, at some point. but. Um, that's uh, the presentation I have for you. Uh, I hope you enjoyed learning about those different stations and the locations where they work here in Carteret County. I'll give uh, this presentation again someday and I'll also give the other uh, Life Saving Service Operation presentation again where I focus more on the whole coast of North Carolina. Um, so I'll take some questions if you have some and otherwise I will thank you guys for coming today. Yes. Okay. Um, the collection of Life Saving Yes. Uh, that's that's a good question. I'm not the best person to, to an answer that as far as where they were uh, acquired from. Um, but they, those pieces that are in there, the Lyle gun, the faking box with the line, um, the breaches buoy, all of that was was something they had at every single one of these stations. The life car uh, that you see that was all at one of these stations. So I don't know specifically on each artifact, like where they came from. Uh, and the breaches buoy itself may be a replica uh, version of a breaches buoy where we, we stitched it in house, exhibit staff um, made one so that it, it looked exactly like an, an original. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, probably a question best answered by our collection staff. <laughs> Um, any, any, anything else or Cindy has a question. Yes. Okay. Well, I'm completely wrong on that. Thank you, Michael, for pointing that out. He was talking about Mount Mitchell when I mentioned it as the first piece of land set aside as a state park. Um, so apparently people could get to it. Anything else? You got any, no questions from you? No. Anyone else? All right. Okay. Uh, we do have another lecture coming up in the near future. Um, not sure which one. Yeah, we have a movie next week at one o'clock, and it's actually on Hammock Speech State Park. So if you're interested in that, it's one o'clock after lunch. Um, so come by next week, and we'll have a, f a free movie presentation. It was put to uh, put to, uh, produced by um, UNCTV, 
the PBS out of uh, uh, Raleigh. Uh, it was very well done. Talks about the history of uh, the park and how it formed and, and uh, came to be a state park. So um, thank you all for coming to today's presentation and thank you for watching online if I'm still live, I don't know. <laughs> uh, anyway, thank you. <laughs>